Hello, everyone. I'm Julie Jenny, Educational Programs Coordinator for the Scott Arboretum, and I'd like to welcome you to Gardens and Tonic, our virtual webinar series. This may be the first Gardens and Tonic for many of you joining in today, and if it is, welcome to our virtual programs. Again, to those of you just joining in, I'm Julie Jenny, Educational Programs Coordinator for the Scott Arboretum of Swarthmore College. Happy Friday Eve to everybody. The campus and extensive gardens of the Scott Arboretum are located in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania and are open to visitors to explore. We also have lots of programs to look forward to, so please visit our website, scottarboretum.org, to see what we are offering. And please do check it often as there may be additions and updates to our programming. And if, again, if you're just joining us, I know some of you are still coming on. Welcome to Scott Arboretum's Gardens and Tonic series. I'm Julie Jenny, the moderator for this virtual series. So I'd like to take a few minutes before we get started with this Gardens and Tonic to mention some of our upcoming programs. The Virtual Perennial Plant Conference is on Friday, October 15th, and that is next Friday, so registration closes soon. To learn more, you can register at perennialplantconference.org, and don't worry, all of these websites I'll be putting into the chat box for you. But the Perennial Plant Conference is a hugely popular annual conference that has been running for over 35 years. So next Friday, we're first virtually traveling to the UK to be with Tim Richardson and his account of the Chelsea Fringe Festival. Festival. We'll then hear from Jeff Epping in Wisconsin about his beautiful and innovative gravel gardens. Next up will be the inspiring Abra Lee on planning your perennial garden, and we'll conclude on the West Coast with Richie Steffens, who's an expert on ferns. So it's going to be a great lineup, and I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, the Perennial Plant Conference um, is, is an outstanding conference. We normally have it in person, so this virtual conference next week, it's a great way to kind of see what it's like and a much more affordable way to do it. So I can't recommend it enough. And you can see um, all about the speakers and their talks, again, at the Perennial plantconference.org website. Our next Gardens and Tonic will be the exuberant, fantastic floral designer Valley McLaughlin on Thursday, October 21st. And you can find the rest of that on our website, which again, I'll put in the chat box. I would also like to take this opportunity to say that Gardens and Tonic are not free of cost to the Scott Arboretum, um, even though we do make them free of charge for you. So for those of you who have felt inspired to donate to this series, I want to say a huge thank you to you. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Please feel free to use the chat box or Q&A for questions, and I will keep track of those for Heather and either read them to her if she prompts me to during the program or at the end of the program. I usually leave about 10 minutes at the end to um, help get those questions answered. Last but not least, a little note about gardens and tonic recordings. I get lots and lots of requests for these, and that's wonderful. I'm happy to do it. So the way to do that, and again, I'll put this in the chat box, is I only receive the request for the recordings through the Monday following each program. So to receive the recording, please send me an email, and in the subject line, just put recording for and the date of the program. So for this one, it would be recording for October 7th. I'm not able to respond to those emails because, or reply to those emails because I get so many, but I will put your email on a list and you will get the recording the Tuesday after the program. So thank you for that. And now onto our program. I'm very pleased to introduce Heather Andrews to you today. Heather is a published author, photographer, traveler, and speaker who routinely works with homeowners and businesses to create sustainable native pollinator habitats. She encourages gardeners to provide wildlife habitat and fuel for native pollinators and improve vegetable yield with pollinator hedgerows and corridors. A graduate of Oglethorpe University in Georgia, Heather combines information from her day job as a clinical researcher to guide her messaging. During the growing season, you will find her in her Monarch Way Station, Caterpillar Haven, and video blogging her garden on her Facebook page, The Thoughtful Gardener. Her garden was recently awarded the Garden of Distinction in 2020 by the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, and her photographs and articles have been featured in various magazines. Her proposal, The Resurgence of Pollinator Hedgerows Using Science to Create a Pollinator Oasis in Your Own Backyard, was accepted at the 2021 International Master Gardeners Conference. 
To follow her educational video log, she can be found on her new YouTube gardening channel, Garden Thoughtfully. And again, for those of you just joining us, I will put all of these websites and links into the chat box after Heather gets started. So Heather, it was so nice to meet you virtually just a little bit ago. Thank you for agreeing to be part of this series and I will now hand it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Julie. And I thank you to all the organizers and, and yourself for inviting me here to be part of this series. I'm super excited to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is really our pollinators and how you can be part of the solution by preparing your fall garden for supporting our pollinators that are starting to migrate, as well as the ones that will be overwintering here and how you can help them get a great start for next spring. So uh, let's talk first about who these pollinators are. Now, certainly we all know about the honeybee and the challenges associated with honeybees, but what you may not know is that in the state of Pennsylvania, the real work courses of the garden are our native bees. We have over 430 native bees here, and those are the ones that do the heavy lifting when it comes to pollinating our gardens. Now, that doesn't take away from bees bats, birds, and other critters, including possums that do pollinating. But when we're talking about the importance of pollinators, we're gonna be really focusing today on some of my favorites, which are our native bees. So let's take a look at what they look like. Yep, they come in all shapes and sizes. And if you were to come into my garden, you might be intimidated by some of the sizes of those bees. Um, a mega chili bee is about the size of a quarter. And they're really, really beautiful and fuzzy. And I love them because I love how they pollinate. If you've ever seen them, they do a really cool trick called buzz pollination, where they like to spin around in the flower. And so I usually can hear them long before I can see them. But they are really interesting in that a lot of these pollinators have specifically evolved with certain plants that are only native to Pennsylvania. And so they, they have a symbiotic relationship and we're gonna talk about why that's important and how you can help them by planting their favorite plants. So in our discussion today, we really wanna talk about why you should include native plants in your garden and how to maximize your garden for these pollinators. In addition, we wanna talk about the high value plants such as uh, our host plants, as you see here, our swamp milkweed, where both we have a monarch caterpillar at the bottom and a monarch butterfly using that same plant and why I can't take that caterpillar and just put them on any other plant. This is their host and it's the only one they will eat. We're also gonna talk about the native plants that I find that the pollinators really love this time of year and then different techniques that you can do today in your own garden that will help maximize the garden and let you be a little bit of a lazy gardener this time of year. And I'll also give you some of those resources so that you too can use those for planning your next season's garden. So you might not be familiar with um, a local in insect celebrity. Uh, Doug Tallamy is an entomologist at the uh, University of Delaware, but he is a Pennsylvania resident. And he has written three books that I highly recommend. Uh, these are some things from his book, Bringing Nature Home. We'll be talking about his new book, uh, which is about oak trees, his favorite topic. Uh, but you may not be aware that we are really in a situation where uh, nature and how we can help nature is starting in our own backyards. And whether you have a big property or even a pot on your porch, you can be part of the solution. So he make, uh, reminds us that development consumes a significant amount of land every single year. And in the state of Pennsylvania, you might not know that we have 4 million acres of grass and grass is the number one watered crop in America. So what am I trying to encourage you to do? 
Well, again, even if you have a pot on a porch, you can make a difference, but maybe consider locating some of these native plants in your existing beds or maybe shrinking the size of your lawn and incorporating some of these native plants in a new bed and creating more space for our wildlife. So I also want to encourage you to, to maybe think about traditional landscape plants slightly differently. So one of those things that I want you to think about is removing some of these exotic evasives that we have that really don't do anything for our native wildlife. One of those that were recently banned here in the state of Pennsylvania is our barberries. And I would say if you were to come into my neighborhood, you'd probably not find one lot that doesn't have at least one in their yard. It's a very, very popular plant. And although we were successful in getting that plant banned for sale and it will be phased out over the next couple of years, it's still in our gardens and it presents a significant problem. Problem number one, nothing eats it nothing. So it's not a great plant for wildlife. And a lot of people like it because of that, because you don't have things that are damaging it. But the problem with it is it harbors ticks. And one thing we're number one is, is Lyme disease. So if you're concerned about tick-borne diseases for your children, yourself, or your pets, you definitely want to think about maybe replacing those plants with a native plant. The other challenge is, is that it puts out beautiful red berries in the fall and in the winter, and those are highly desirable to our birds. And the challenge of that is those get deposited into our forests. Volunteers recently removed eight acres of this plant in Michaud State Forest. And I can tell you, I spent a lot of pandemic removing that plant in my tiny forest. But if you were to walk just another 100 yards into my neighbor's property and the adjoining forest they're responsible for, it's literally a thicket. So we have a problem, and I want to encourage you to be part of the solution by maybe going out and taking some walks this fall and winter. Pretty much anything that's in your forest that green is likely not native. So you definitely want to identify it and maybe look at removing it. So certainly, since so much of our land is privately owned, I certainly want to encourage you to be part of the solution and create a pollinator paradise in your own backyard. So why native plants? Well, I am a butterfly girl. I'm going to admit that through and through. My Monarch Way Station not only hosts the monarch butterflies, but lots of different pollinators. And if you were to walk down at any time of the day, and today is no different, I saw two monarchs. I saw a fritillary, like what you're seeing in this picture, and I saw lots and lots of different types of bees, and they're all doing the same thing. They're fueling up for either the fall migration in terms of the monarchs, lots of birds eating the seeds that I've left of my plants that have faded, but those seeds are very valuable in terms of fat content. So if you're a birder, this applies to you too. But more, and moreover, when I moved here, I really was using wisdom that had been passed down to me as a little girl in North Carolina. I'm one of 12 grandchildren and my granddaddy Andrews always grew an acre garden for me and my 12 cousins. And what he taught me is a secret that I'm gonna share with you. He always had honeybees and he used to tell me that the years his honeybees did well, his garden did well. Well, I don't raise honeybees, but I do want to maximize my garden. And you can imagine my surprise being a Southerner, moving here that first growing season and experiencing frost until Mar May 15th. You have a very short growing season in this state. And I wanted to do everything I could to maximize the produce that would come out of my garden. So I took what he taught me and what clinical research supports, which is if you can grow more food by attracting pollinators into your garden. And really the master gardeners of Perry County were the one who got me interested in this by giving me some native pollinator plants and encouraging me to plant those plants and I thought, you know, I'm going to do what my granddaddy taught me, put them right in my garden with these vegetable plants. 
And I had such a huge bumper crop that year that I told my neighbors, if they didn't come get that food, I was going to reverse ding dong ditch them and leave bags of produce on their doorstep. The other advantage of putting native plants in is it's going to invite the good guys into your yard and you're going to have less damage to your plants from those bad guys. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in this presentation. I think the other thing that you want to think about when you're thinking about native plants is they are very good at water management. Now, if you were like me this summer, we experienced a lot of rain in a very short period of time. And the problem with our grass is that it's not a very good sponge. It only absorbs about one inch of water per hour. But these native plants have extensive root systems. And you can see just in this small picture, a few that are being featured and how deep those roots actually go. Now, you may not know that we're routinely sued by the state of Maryland because they are the sixth largest watershed in, shed in the world, the Chesapeake Bay. And our water comes down through Pennsylvania and floods into the bay. And a lot of runoff comes from our farms, but also from our grass. So I'll tell you a little story. I do some consulting for a, um, a beautiful resort in Bedford Springs, Pennsylvania. It's a, a historical property. I highly recommend uh, going there, but I want to encourage you to go there to see their native plants. Because when I got there, what I realized very quickly is that 20 years ago, they had a terrible flood and the property was destroyed. Omni Hotels came in and spent about $120 million to restore it. But one thing they did is they planted native plants. And if you are to walk out onto their golf course or up at Red uh, Oak Lake, what you will see is native plants land, that line those waterways. So this was one of the largest public works projects that was ever conducted in Pennsylvania, where the creek over hundreds of years had moved out of its bed and they were able to figure out where it needed to go, but they secured that bank with these long rooted native plants. Do you know that property flooded again, but the water did not get into the hotel? And I, I, I personally believe that one of the reasons why is because of the root structures of those native plants. This is a picture from National Geographic. I really admire the work that these scientists did. They grew these native plants in long tubes and what they were able to do is then stand on tall ladders and take a series of pictures because these root structures are so long. This is a blue stem, which is a beautiful, beautiful grass. But those roots are taller than that scientist who's over six feet tall. And you can see how important this becomes and when you're talking about the periods of rain and drought, that these plants make a huge difference. And once these plants are established, usually within two years, they really take very little water whatsoever. They're used to, and they are specifically adapted to our climate and can handle these very big changes in weather. And bonus, this one hosts 13 of our native butterflies. So I want to talk to you, too, about the reason why I think it's important for you to think about growing these plants for management of bad guys. So in my own yard, I can't use chemicals. I have a, a genetically compromised pet. In addition, my pollinator garden is located in such an area that that pest management is not possible. So this year I had a nest of yellow jackets and I'm gonna tell you a story about that, but I, the, I couldn't spray it and I didn't wanna spray it because it was so close to my pollinator garden. But because I have created a sanctuary for wildlife, I have a family of skunks. I have a family of five right now. And guess what their favorite food is? The, the little tiny caterpillars that are part of those yellow jacket nests. So I noticed in the late summer that someone was trying to pull my stone steps apart and they actually dug a hole adjacent to those stairs 
and they ate those larvae. So I didn't have to do anything. Mother nature took care of that for me, but I find that true in my pollinator garden too. Early in the summer, I was growing lots of common milkweed and I noticed it was covered in sooty mold. Never a good sign uh, that is from the aphids. And I didn't do a thing because I had caterpillars already on it. I didn't want to mess with the possibility that I would hurt them by trying to get rid of the aphids. So I just waited and here comes mother nature again. The lace wings moved in, the ladybugs moved in. And within a week, it looked like somebody had polished each one of those leaves. So I want to encourage you that the good guys will come find the bad guys and you're needing to do pest management if you will incorporate these plants into your garden becomes significantly less. So what are some other things that you can consider? Uh, well, data says that pollinator strips, also called pollinator hedgerows or insectaries are fantastic if you're also trying to grow food. In my own yard, I have a compact area where a previous wall is above it. So the ground is very, very compacted. And because of that, uh, it's really difficult to dig in that dirt. So I made a decision early on that I was gonna feed the soil. So I ordered some fruit trees because I wanna espalier them along that, that wall. And I overseeded that area with crimson clover. Now, crimson clover is a nat uh, nitrogen fixer. So it did its work and put lots of nitrogen in the soil. So that when my trees arrived in early spring, you know, it was already feeding the soil. In addition, I planted carrot tops. Now, why would I plant carrot tops? Carrots are like the little rototillers of the garden. And by putting down those deep roots, they're going to break up that soil naturally. But I didn't grow them for me to eat. I grew them for the swallowtails. So the parsley family, dill, and carrots are all host plants for our swallowtails. And interestingly, I was telling Jenny, I picked some flowers out of my garden to show you that there's tons of things growing in the shoulder season right now. And carrots are one of them. And I, unbeknownst to me, when I cut the flower, there's a baby swallowtail eating that flower right now. So we'll take him back out to the garden. But the, the bottom line is that you can definitely impact your garden by growing these hedgerows or insectaries. Now imagine you're a butterfly and you're flying over grass, you are vulnerable, but by flying over one of these hedgerows or pollinator strips, it gives you a lot of places to land, to rest, to eat, and to hide. And certainly there are reasons why that a mother swallowtail has laid that baby caterpillar in my insectary because caterpillars are nature's hot dogs and they're very delicious to birds. So if you want to not get eaten, you definitely want to hide. And that's why that caterpillar is in my insectary. Now this idea of hedgerows is not a new concept. They've been used for years over in Europe. And you can see by this picture exactly what I'm talking about, that tons of research has been done on this subject. But hedgerows typically were put in to define boundaries. So between you and your neighbor, they also were used to create windbreaks if you had a, a very windy property. But what we notice is that a lot of wildlife uses them to move property to property. And they're super beneficial if you're trying to grow food. So again, by inviting these good predators into your garden, you can deal with some of the pests that we normally would want to keep out of the garden with chemicals. So you can reduce the amount of chemical pressure on your property by putting some of these hedgerows in. And that's certainly what clinical trials have suggested. And uh, we're very fortunate to have a lot of agriculture universities surround us. So this is some of the data that is showing exactly what I saw in my garden, that you can severely increase the yield of your fruit, 
and vegetables by planting wildflower strips in your gardens. Now, in this particular case, they were trying to show that it was appropriate to do this instead of honeybees. Now, on the West Coast, we certainly see a lot of honeybee use for things like almonds. But on the East Coast, our native pollinators really do the heavy lifting. And they found that the fields that they put these wildflower strips were very productive, way more productive than a traditional honeybee hive. So if you think about this, this is one of the reasons why I want you to think about putting these in your own gardens. What's the impact of that? Well, the good news is, is that Rutgers University put out a survey last year. They did this in conjunction with other states looking at apple crop and our native pollinators alone add about $1.5 billion to our economy just in apples. So you by planting these wildflowers are also helping our farmers and you're helping yourself too because you're providing more habitat. So I wanna um, certainly stop there and ask if there's questions that I can answer or happy to uh, explain something if it didn't make sense. Anything that I can answer? Yes, yeah, so Heather, the first question that came in was, is butterfly bush junk food for insects? <laughs> uh, so uh, the way that I look at butterfly bushes is it's certainly not the only thing you want in your garden. I can seriously understand the idea of having it in the garden. It is um, obviously quite beautiful. They come in lots of different sizes. They are definitely not native. They're from China. Um, however, they do attract pollinators. And I do have them on this property. They, I bought this as a foreclosure. They're on the property. But I will tell you that shouldn't be your only source of pollen um, and it's, or, 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 or nectar. And it certainly should not be. Um, you need to be aware that they're terrible spreaders. So at the end of this season, I would knock it down so that it doesn't reseed. Okay, good, good advice. Um, and speaking of plants that like to spread around, uh, people have asked, how are you removing your barberry? What's the best way to make sure you're getting rid of it? Oh, this is really frustrating because it's like a hydra. Um, I have one out front that it was so huge that I had to have my landscaper take it out. But do you know that sucker is putting out suckers? <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, so you really have got to be super careful if you're going to take it out. You're going to need long sleeves and long pants and uh, really good gloves. Um, I would cut it first and make it into a manageable size and remove those barberries. And then I, you're going to have to dig it out. And I will tell you, it is a big project. So there are things on this property I like to do. And there's things on this property that I just physically can't cannot do. So if you have a large one like I did, I'd probably get a professional to help you take it out. Yeah, that I had one and I cut it back and then I had somebody much stronger than myself dig out the rest of it. Yep. Yep. Um, it's really difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're nasty. They're, they're not yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, somewhat uh, thinking back to the beginning of your talk, someone was asking, what is the white flower the fritillary is on? They were wondering if it was bone set. That's correct. Yes, yeah. it's boon set. Right. And um, that's a beautiful native plant. Ironically, I have never planted one on my property. The birds no. did it for me. Yes. And it's all over my property. Yeah. So once you have one, you will have plenty to share with your friends. Yes, but it is beautiful this time of year. And if yes. you if you don't want a lot of them, I found it's easy to, to pull them out when they're young. You have to do it when they're young. Very yes. tiny. Yeah. Um, and they smell like great Kool-Aid to me. So if the wind catches it just right, it's it actually smells really good. <laughs> oh, that's good to know. Um, where do you buy your native plants? If you were where what's a good source for you in this area? 
Fantastic. So um, I definitely recommend patronizing your native plant nurseries. And there is a uh, link um, that we can put up, uh, Julie, that has all of the native plant nurseries in our geography. Um, okay. But where I usually send people, um, depending on if you're a uh, butterfly person or if you're a bird person, uh, nationalwildlifefederation.org uh, native plant find you put your zip code in, it'll not only tell you the keystone plants that you might want to consider for your property that will host the most butterflies, but in addition, it gives you a list of the native plant nurseries as well. Audubon for our birders out there, very similar uh, process that they have. And both of those, you can print those lists off, you can save them um, and take them with you to the nursery, but both of them give you sources for plants. So that was nationalwildlifefederation.org plant finder. It's a native plant finder. Yep. Native and then audubon.org. Plant finder and audubon.org. Okay. Yes. And those are both have really nice pictorials. They tell you what else it attracts, how many it hosts. And we're going to definitely go through that. So um, I will have those uh, as a last slide too, uh, Julie. Okay. Terrific. Um, what, one last uh, question. Where was the Omni Hotel you mentioned? In Bedford Springs, Pennsylvania. Okay. So right. Definitely worth a trip this time of year because the foliage is beautiful and you don't have to stay there. You could just have a nice lunch and then uh, make sure that you uh, not only see the pollinator plants on the golf course, but drive just beyond the resort. They own Red Oak Lake, which is a perfect mirror lake surrounded by mountains, which are colorful trees. And you will see the pollinators right there in the parking lot. It is lined with pollinator plants. So definitely worth a drive. All right. That sounds great. And lots of back and forth comments on Lovage, but I feel like everybody's gotten excited about Lovage and have been answering each other. So I think we're set on that. So, <laughs> That's so. a great one. And herbs are great. Uh, I absolutely love that plant. Uh, it's pretty tasty too, uh, yes. uh, which is and beautiful if you like to cook and have flowers in your food. Um, but uh, herbs are a great way to uh, help the pollinators as well. Okay. Terrific. All right. That's it. Um, thank you Perfect. for stopping for questions. That was a great. No problem. My pleasure. And please feel free to put them in the chat or the oh, QA. Uh, if you're joining us late, we'd love to be able to answer your questions. So how do you maximize your garden for pollinators? Well, certainly you want to think like a bird. So I'm going to let you put your bird hat on for a minute and think about being a mama bird. And you're thinking about putting a nest in your yard. And do you have these things where she would be willing to put a nest. Uh, obviously, she is looking for things that she herself is going to need to eat because she's going to need those fat reserves to put to produce eggs. Um, in addition, uh, our birds, ironically, especially our hummingbirds, are very efficient pollinators. Uh, but she's going to be looking for shelter. And I'm not just talking about bird houses. I'm thinking about trees and shrubs that she can build her nest as well as things she's going to need to build her nest with, but she's also going to be looking to protect them, which is why she likes to put them up underneath your awnings. So if anybody wants to put in the chat, uh, how many caterpillars do you think it will take as a mother bird for you to feed a nest? You guys want to take a few guesses? All right. You got a number in mind? Here we go. Six. What was that? Sorry, we've got a lot coming in, but they're they're very high. <laughs> <laughs> so they are right if they're very high. So the reality is, is that you're going to need 400 caterpillars per day. And this is a little birdhouse that I have on my property. Uh, we do have lots of oak trees. And if you are a bird and you are flying over the neighborhoods of Pennsylvania, the first thing you're going to look for is an oak tree. According to Doug Tallamy, our oaks host 534 different types of caterpillars. So it is truly the smorgasbord of trees. And other trees too are very valuable, but you got to think about the kind of work that this little bird is going to do to keep those babies fed. And so it's really important that she doesn't have to fly very far to be able to feed her babies. 
Um, the other thing about our oak trees is that they put out lots and lots of acorns this time of year. So if you're a hunter or you love wildlife, uh, those acorns provide a lot of very valuable food sources and fat sources for our wildlife. Um, certainly, I want you to think about native to the area. So uh, if you're looking for native trees right now, one, it's a little bit of a drive, but I highly recommend this nursery is Edge of the Woods Nurseries. And right now I know there are oak trees are 50% off. So this is a great time to plant an oak tree. And there is one for every situation. They aren't all massive in size. Some will take dry, some will take wet, uh, 80 native varieties to this area. So I also want you to think about growing a garden that is going to bloom over a significant period of time. And you can see my pollinator garden here, and there's lots of different variety of plants for this monarch to choose from. It is actually nectaring on a liatris that's not native to this area, but I absolutely love it's native to North America. It's a, a, it's a, a prairie plant that they find irresistible. And we'll talk a little bit more about this plant, but right behind it, those yellow flowers are cut leaf cone flower. Once you have one, you will have plenty, but everybody loves these flowers. And it's not unusual that I see bees and hummingbirds and butterflies using both of these. But what becomes important for our native pollinators is that you have things blooming early in the season, and late in the fall. And we're in that shoulder season right now where we're really trying to fuel these monarchs on their way to Mexico. We're trying to fuel our birds, both the ones that are gonna stay here in the area as well as over winter in other parts of the country. In addition, we're also trying to feed those native bees. So the females are the ones that actually will live here during the winter, as well as many of our native butterflies and moths. And so they're really fueling right now on these high value nectar sources. So I'm gonna give you several that I'd recommend you consider in your own garden that will be pollinator magnets, but high value fuel for them to make their trek or feed them if they're staying here over the winter. And certainly that's what the Pollinator Partnership is suggesting in this slide is that you want to think about a method that I like to call three by three by three. So three plants that are going to grow over three seasons in at least a three by three area. Their example has three by six. And if you've got a larger garden, that's fine. Just multiply this out. But they're giving you examples of native plants in our geography that are going to carry your pollinators through our shoulder seasons. So one of the first ones you'll see in my garden is our local columbine. Beautiful flower, no fuss, great for shade. So you don't have to have sun here um, as the only thing for pollinators. There are lots of native pollinator plants that grow great in the shade. Now, this time of year, we're really thinking about our New England aster and other types of asters, as well as our goldenrods. And the goldenrods have been glorious this year because of all the rain. I'm sure you're seeing them on the roadsides and they have popped up all over my garden. In fact, I don't think 90% of the goldenrods on this property, I didn't plant them. Definitely the birds did. But this is the beauty of leaving these seeds standing. Uh, I can see my Joe Pye weed right now is covered in seeds and I'm going to leave it. I will clip some because I'm going to start some for seeds for other gardens gardeners and for garden projects that I work on for my master gardener program. But I, my goal is, is to leave as many seeds as I can so that the birds have something to eat this winter. And certainly for your pollinators as they're foraging, there are plants that they have specifically evolved with that are native to this area that only that relationship exists. So one of these that I absolutely love is our native verbenas. Uh, usually blooms in late August, but the tiniest, tiniest bee actually pollinates that plant. 
And that's the challenge. 75% of our native pollinators only use 5% of our plants. So if these are not in your garden, our native pollinators don't have anything to eat. Yes, there are generalists like honeybees. Honeybees will pretty much go to anything, but there are specialist bees that only go to certain plants. And those plants have co-evolved with these pollinators. For example, our monarchs. Our monarch caterpillars only eat butterfly weed or um, our milkweeds. And so if you if a butterfly lands in your garden and this time of year, they are traveling many, many miles every single day. My question is, do they have anything to eat? Now, they're not laying eggs this time of year, but they'll be laying eggs next spring as they make their way back north. And the only plant they will lay their eggs on is our milkweed. So if you don't have milkweed, I'm gonna encourage you to try to plant some. And it's kind of like Pringles, you can't just have one. Uh, my first year, the native, uh, the, the master gardeners of Perry County gave me two plants. They forced them into my hand. They're like, you have to have this. I had no idea that I was gonna become a monarch, a maniac because of them, but they totally got me hooked because I watched the caterpillars eat those plants to the ground and quickly realized I needed more milkweed. So we're going to talk to you about that, about what you should do if you are interested in, in helping our monarchs and how you can also plant things that will help the monarchs come and visit your garden. It's not just about milkweed. That's important, but we want that mama monarch, mama monarch, mama monarch to land in your yard. And the way we're going to do that is to give her high value nectar sources. So I, one of the master gardeners said to me, you know, I planted milkweed and nobody came. I was so disappointed. And I said, well, that's, that's okay. Tell me about your nectar sources. And she said, well, I have daylilies and irises. That is not what we're talking about. Yes, they're pretty. Yes, they're in my yard, but that is not what the monarch is going to be looking for. She is going to be super hungry when she lands and she's going to be laying eggs. So we need to fuel her. So these plants are things that she would enjoy and that our bees, our native bees would like. And this is from uh, Rutgers University and you can go on their website and download a guide like this that, that will tell you which plants are specifically adapted for those bees. The other thing you want to think about is color. Um, certainly it's better for insects if they can see plants in drifts. So if you have the area, that's why I want you to get three of a kind at minimum, because it makes it easier for the pollinator to see that color. In addition, um, there are things that are attracted to certain colors. And I just learned a really cool trick about one of our native plants called bottle gentian. So interestingly, our bees don't see the color red very well. And so our bottle gentian knows that and it takes a really big bee to force the flower open. When it blooms, it's actually closed. The bee has to force its way in. And once it's forced its way in, its tip turns red. And that's a signal to future bees not to visit because the delicious nectar that that plant has is gone. It is truly the, the soda of the native plant world. It has the most sugar of any native plant that we have, and it is the most brilliant color blue. So I definitely look for it. It's a shade plant too, for those gardeners out there with shade. Last but not least, if you've got plant diversity and insect, you'll have insect diversity. So you definitely want to think about the weeds and flowers that have evolved with these pollinators. So when you're thinking about the spring, I want you to be very cautious in taking out your weeds quote unquote. So I see our early spring pollinators using the crimson clover in my insectary, the dandelions that bloom, Certainly some of the early blooming plants they definitely use, but when they wake up, they're starving. And that is your next year's bees. That bee has already been fertilized. She's got eggs ready to go. She needs food to fuel her and she's gonna start laying those eggs. So I leave my dead nettle, for example, in my shady areas because I know that she's gonna use that plant 
The other thing that I have done is I have left the majority of my perennials standing. So don't be so urgent in your mind to clean up your garden. At least leave six to 12 inches of your native pollinator plant standing. Those pithy stems are your next year's bee bassinets. And so she's going to lay her eggs down inside of those. Furthermore, this fall, don't clean them up because a lot of our insects use those as the bee hotels. So it's really important to leave those things standing for to be able to help our next year's insects. What about density and configuration? So again, we talked about drifts already. Uh, the, the, uh, the advice is to do eight or more plants. That's a really big garden. So I, min I recommend it minimum of three, but there is some data about milkweed. So there was a study that they did just a milkweed patch, and then they did a milkweed patch with native pollinator plants. In this case, they used hibiscus, swamp uh, sunflowers, and the liatris that we talked about, blazing stars. And interestingly, they found that monarchs were more likely to lay eggs where there was a diversity available to them. And ideally, if you put the milkweed on the outside of the bed and the pollinator plants in the center, they were more likely to lay eggs. Now, one thing you might not be aware of is that Pennsylvania has funds available to you to potentially consider converting part of your lawn into a meadow or a forest. And again, they're recognizing that we can potentially pay a lot less in fees and fines by uh, converting our lawns to wildlife habitat. So if you're interested in this program, we'll make sure to get that link in the uh, chat for you, but you can go to this and you can apply for the program. And uh, I understand this year they had more applications than they've ever had. So more, the word is getting out. So uh, Jenny, I'd be glad to, uh, Julie, I'd be glad to take uh, some questions from the audience. If you have things there, I can answer for you. Sure, no problem. Um, not really a question, but um, just an interesting comment to people who might feel like they have too much goldenrod is that goldenrod makes a great natural dye, which I didn't know that. So well, how about that? pass that on. Um, but also just thought I would mention to people that if um, those of you, if you're looking in your chat box, um, I put in a bunch of links in the very beginning. It was the first um, uh, chat that I put in there. But um, no, other than that, I think people are just listening intently to you and uh, taking it all in. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Well, I'll also tell you, it makes a really good tea. Um, I uh, had the opportunity to do a, a tea tasting of native plants at the Edge of the Woods Nursery um, about a month ago, and goldenrod was one of the teas that we got to taste, and it's really good. So maybe think about making some tea out of it uh, if it's overwhelming your garden. Uh, but I guarantee if you put it out on your, uh, you know, your social media sites that you have too much goldenrod, there will definitely be a native plant gardener who'd be happy to take it off your hands. So let's talk a little bit about some of these plants. And did I, I'm sorry, did I miss the question? Nope, that was, okay. there's lots, if you're seeing things coming up, there's lots of little side conversations about all of the wonderful plants that you're mentioning and people saying how many things they've had visit them. So not really questions, but just a fun co side conversations. <laughs> Great. So I have the chat minimized because I don't want to be distracted by it, but I wanted to say that one of the ones that I absolutely love, because I just love this jewel tone and uh, University of Chicago um, Botanical Garden just put out a really nice paper on ironweed. There really is one for every single garden. Um, this is a great host plant for our native butterflies. Now I find that mine, I have a New York ironweed. I also have the fern leaf ironweed. The New York tends to get a little tall and leggy. So um, I like to tell people, put on your best English accent and give it a Chelsea chop. So off with their heads on May 31st, 
We're going to cut this plant halfway down. And then on July 4th, we're going to cut it again by a third. And I use this technique for a lot of my fall blooming pollinator plants. And that's on purpose because otherwise they have a tendency to get really tall and leggy and they have a tendency to flop, which is really frustrating. So I use this technique a lot and it works on almost everything. So um, do not be afraid. These are super hardy plants. And I actually think they prefer to have a little bit of a haircut. Another one that is well loved by the pollinators and is just a bell of the of the botanical garden is our native hibiscus. Now, if you've grown tropical hibiscus, I'm going to make you a convert. This is beautiful and it comes in many different colors including a variety called disco which is bright red so i have both this one that you see and the bright red version and you can see how this bee has done that little bee dance right in the center of that flower it's completely covered in pollen and i can hear them buzzing around doing what's called buzz pollination where they're creating electricity on their body to gather up as much pollen as possible. Joe pie weed is also a pollinator favorite in my garden, but the traditional Joe pie weed is exceptionally tall. And I find for most gardeners that I work with, it's just a little too tall and overwhelming. So Chelsea chop it again, Memorial Day by half and a third um, on July 4th or look for the native R. So let's have a conversation about native R, native and cultivar. Now our native is the traditional one that gets somewhere between nine and 11 feet tall, which is really tall for most gardens. So I also have little Joe, which is significantly shorter, gets about four to seven feet tall. Uh, that is a native R. What that means is all we've done is really just affected the height of the plant. And our pollinators still use this plant. They absolutely love it. It's a long bloomer. But I also made the mistake of buying the cultivar. Now the cultivar a version of this has variegated leaves. And while I think it's very pretty, the pollinators really don't like it. So this is a huge debate in the community right now, but just as a rule of thumb, I have found for the most part that most of my pollinators really prefer, they, they really prefer the native R or the native if you can get it. Sunflowers. So I have lots of different types of sunflowers in my garden. Uh, these are sunflowers. A friend of mine took this picture, but I have a uh, cut leaf, uh, which again is, I will call her aggressive. We won't call her invasive, but it's a big spreader because I let it go to seed for the birds. Um, I also have um, other different types of native sunflowers in my garden and everybody loves them. Uh, beautiful long bloomers. And then obviously if you can get to them before the seeds get taken by the birds, uh, they can be something for you to enjoy as well. But you see how many butterflies it hosts. Now we're really getting uh, uh, very exciting. 92 butterflies that our, um, our golden rods host. And you, there really is a golden rod for everybody. I've got them in my garden that are probably four or five feet tall. And then I have little uh, diminutive ones that are like fireworks and just sort of trail over the wall. So um, what I love to do, though, is just to go down and see who's using it. And every time I go down, there are all kinds of interesting looking caterpillars and all kinds of bees and other insects on this plant. And this is one of our bee hotels. So when you are done with it in the season, leave it standing or at least six to 12 inches of it so that our, our insects can drill holes in those pithy stems and spend the winter in your garden. Um, now, a lot of people get this plant confused with sneezeweed. This is not a plant that gives you allergies. Goldenrod is pollinator pollinated, not wind pollinated, but it's often confused with sneezeweed because sneezeweed blooms at the same time and has a similar color. 
if you really want to be fancy, I am a huge fan of our asters, and this is a New England aster. Um, I also grow calico aster and white wood aster in my garden. Uh, I always find pollinators on this plant. I do find that the New England aster does get a bit leggy, and so it gets that hard Chelsea haircut every uh, late spring and then again early summer. And uh, it's late to bloom, which is really fantastic for these late pollinators that are emerging and are also um, getting ready to uh, head out for the fall. This is a really good plant that provides a lot of amino acids as well as um, will help them on their journey. Now, this is one of my personal favorites. Um, I love the spice bush swallowtail. Um, this one actually is in a tree called a sassafras that you see here. He starts off looking like a little bitty tiny shrimp and he rolls himself up in the leaves, which is how I know he's there. But as he gets larger, he starts to resemble a garden snake. Isn't he intimidating? I don't think so, but I think he's really cute. So uh, the kids like to come and enroll him from the leaf and take a quick look at him and see how big he's gotten that week. Um, but he makes an absolute stunning butterfly, which you see on the right. Another fun one, if you've got room for a very, very tall vine, uh, this is Dutchman's Pipe, and those are pipe vine swallowtail caterpillars, another endangered butterfly uh, that could use your assistance. Now, my vine is an, probably in a little bit too much sun, so I'm probably going to move it this year. It's been in the ground for three years, and this is really the first year that it's gone up and over the arch. Should be about 50 feet tall. Uh, but uh, it, they literally ate me out of house and home. Uh, so I had to call another master gardener and uh, beg that they would take some of my caterpillars, which they happily did. And there was a, a big transfer of caterpillars uh, over to their garden because it had eaten all of my um, all of my plant uh, down to the stems, but you can see how stunningly beautiful that butterfly is. So I will um, recommend that you give it a, a, a run in your garden if you've got something for it to climb. Another one that I absolutely just takes my breath away every time I see it, this is our zebra swallowtail. Yes, you too can have zebras in your garden. Uh, I actually saw this at our beautiful native wildflower preserve in Conestoga, Pennsylvania. Early in the season, late April, we went to see all the beautiful bluebells that grow there by the thousands. I definitely recommend you give that a shot if you're looking for a really fun spring trip to see our native wildflowers or spring ephemerals. Ephemeral means fleeting, so it's usually only there for a couple of weeks. Uh, it's called Shanks Ferry. It's a historical site. There's a really interesting story about that property, so but I'll leave it to you to figure that out. But I imagine my surprise that I saw a zebra in April, who would have thought? Uh, but the reason why it was there is something that is really important for you to know, which is this is a native butterfly that overwinters in our leaf litter. Its host plant is the pawpaw that you see on the right. Pawpaw trees make a delicious fruit this time of year, very difficult to find. If you're here locally in central Pennsylvania, uh, we do have farms that have it. Threefold Farm typically has uh, pawpaws available for sale, but unfortunately they ripen really fast and they need to be consumed right away, uh, which is why you don't see them commercially, but it's the only tropical fruit that is native to the state of Pennsylvania. And if you want zebras in your yard, you need at least two of them to get them to grow. So we're going to talk a little bit about fall cleanup and prep so we can get ready for your pollinators. Uh, I love this picture from Empress of Dirt where she's made like a little crib of all of her fallen stems. Those will be used by our birds that stay over the winter to uh, give themselves some shelter. They'll also take those twigs and build nests out of them the following year. So um, I love this idea. Um, she can also use those for propping up plants, which is something I do 
often in the garden. Um, but I want to be very careful about how we manage our leaves. The trick is, if you can, that if the leaves fall on your property, you should try to keep them on your property because they provide very valuable habitat for our next year's butterflies. And if you're chopping or shredding them, while they're going to be great for your garden, and I highly recommend that, I don't want you to do that to all of your leaves. Try, if you can, to leave them under your trees or maybe behind your bushes or under your bushes so that some of our butterflies and caterpillars can have a place to spend the winter. This little tiny swallowtail caterpillar is not going to hatch this year. It's going to create a chrysalis and it's going to find a safe place and it's going to overwinter here in Pennsylvania and hopefully we'll see him next spring. But if you are chopping up all of your leaves, or putting them on the curb, you are sending next year's butterflies and insects out of your garden. So I'm going to tell you to be a little bit of a lazy gardener. And I know that most of us live in neighborhoods or maybe communities that have specific rules. And this is really where you come in as part of the solution. I am often called to testify in front of our um, local community uh, governor uh, governances um, who are making the rules about pollinator gardens, who are making the rules about lawns. And typically within 30 minutes, they've gone from goldenrod and pollinator gardens look messy to we're going to change our ordinances. And it's really, if you think about it, it's a cost savings from a standpoint of less maintenance um, to the properties they manage, uh, less chemical use because native plants don't require chemicals and less water usage. And so they're usually very amenable to that when you explain the why. And that's what I hope I've, I've instilled in you is some talking points that you can say, look, this is why I'm doing this. And I am a huge fan of lightning bugs and lightning bugs also overwinter in that leaf litter. So it's really important to leave them. So all of these butterflies that you see in this picture overwinter here in the state of Pennsylvania. So I love butterflies. I'm sure you do too. And by leaving the leaf litter, we're going to ensure that we get to see these guys next year. And the one on the left is that girl fritillary. It is um, endangered in this area. So uh, great spangled, sorry, great spangled fritillary uh, is endangered. So if you can do what you can to help, um, I know they and I would very much appreciate it. There's another reason to leave the leaves, and that reason is that we are finding that we have another invasive. I feel like every week uh, we have a new one to talk about. A spotted lanternfly has been on the radar for a lot of central Pennsylvanians because they're now starting to see them, but we also have Asian jumping worms, and you might not have heard of this pest, but let me assure you they're here. I have a tiny creek in my tiny forest, and um, I do some uh, TV spots with uh, Ed Russo on C CBS 21, and we'll be doing one tomorrow about this particular topic. So you're getting a little insider preview. But the oak leaves that fall do have tannins in them, and those tannins seem to deter this pest. If you're seeing your soil look like coffee grounds, that's because of Asian jumping worms. They are highly destructive to our um, to our soil and can destroy forests. But we do know that oak trees seem to deter them. And uh, because my creek overflowed its bank, not once, but twice this season, they sadly are farther and farther into my tiny forest. And so we're gonna be doing a little bit about that tomorrow and how these oak leaves will hopefully keep them at bay. We don't have a good solution for them sadly right now, but plant an oak tree that will. Last but not least, I certainly want to talk to you about no dig gardening. Doesn't that sound lovely? Um, I have actually used this technique in my own garden. I have taught people this technique and it absolutely works. I will never put in a new garden any other way but to use this technique. Uh, the gentleman you see here is from England. He teaches this technique. I highly recommend uh, learning more about no dig gardening and he has really set the standard for this because you can grow more food with less effort. But essentially how it works is this. I have a really complex clay area, which is why I have a lot of raised beds. I put cardboard down and I put six inches of compost and I planted directly in that compost. 
I have not weeded that bed not once this season. And I know you're going to say, that's crazy. There's no way it's possible. So I want you to spend some time learning about the no dig technique. I highly, highly recommend it. You'll need to continue to put six inches of compost every year on that, but I will do that and not weed. It allows you to be a little bit of a lazy gardener, but guess what? It's warmer than your soil. Your plants will love it. And the only thing I would recommend is know where your compost is coming from. Now, in my case, it's coming off my own property. I know where it came from, but if you're getting it from a farm, you might want to soak it overnight in some water and then pour it on your seedlings because there's nothing worse than killing all of your seedlings because the compost had some kind of chemical in it and it kills your plants. Last but not least, leave your seed heads. I realize this time of year, it may be unsightly to some people, but it provides very valuable fuel for our migrating and overwintering birds. If you were to go into my garden anytime in the winter, I'll have 30 or 40 finches in the garden, and it's because I leave my seed heads standing. Um, obviously, next spring, when it comes around April, I will take them down, but I will leave 6 to 12 inches for those new bees that are emerging and are going to be leaving at least laying their eggs. So uh, in, in summary, uh, with the checklist, I just want to encourage you to think about how you can work with nature. Putting some of these plants in your garden is going to reduce some of the work that you're going to need to do in terms of managing pests on your property and growing more food. Um, and also want to encourage you too to leave some of your soil uncovered for our, for our overwintering and native bees Many of our native bees do nest in the ground and in the leaf litter. And by pulling some of your mulch back, mine right by my pollinator garden is where they uh, live. I have never been stung by a native bee. They are not aggressive whatsoever. Um, and I just tell kids when they're in my garden, please don't try to catch them and they won't bother you. They're very interested in collecting pollen. They don't care about you. Um, but certainly think about plants that you can have early in the season, like our weeds, violets and dead nettle and uh, our dandelions. And then this time of year, those late season goldenrods and asters are so critical to the migration and to our pollinators. And certainly if uh, you would like these resources, um, we mentioned early two resources for uh, native plants and what might be best for your area, as well as um, you know my contact information. I do love to teach on this subject. So you can join me on YouTube where I put up very helpful uh, 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 videos about my garden and the things I'm doing and the plants that I'm using and how you can help our pollinators. Um, I also have a website. And if you would like a guide to these plants, if you will share your email with us, we will immediately send you the guide and uh, really appreciate um, and very honored to be here. So happy to answer any other questions, Julie, from the audience. And uh, thank you so much. I hope this was helpful. Absolutely, Heather. Thank you. So much important, great information. And I can tell that you've got people really thinking about this. And and it, and I really like how um, listening to Doug Tallamy, articles that I've been reading, what you're saying is all really coming together. And I think that we actually might start to make some changes um, here soon with, with a lot of this. So, um, But we do have some good questions in here. And uh, this first one, since it kind of has to do with a lot of what you were finishing up with, I'll, I'll start with it. I don't know if there is a solution, but but uh, Carl says, being incurably lazy, I'm fine with letting the garden go in the fall. But the fly in the buttermilk is the perfect habitat for beneficials is also perfect for ticks. Any recommendations on how to encourage one without the other? So uh, great question. I mean, obviously, removing uh, plants that harbor them like our barberries would be my first suggestion. Um, I also, um, you know, by inviting wildlife in, uh, believe it or not, uh, your uh, your your possums and your skunks, which I have plenty of, uh, do eat them for you. Uh, so I do notice that since I have a skunk family of five currently, um, we have not had as many ticks this year. So um, so. I, I understand your concern and I realize how frustrating that can be, but I do find that I don't see as many on my property now that I have incorporated a lot of the good guy plants. Um, they just don't seem to be as an issue for us. 
Okay, terrific. Uh, from Elizabeth here, are people actively reintroducing butterflies while planting their larval, larval host species? Is it important to make sure you are in the historical native range to do this? Are there ethical considerations to raising, releasing butterflies? Okay, great questions. Um, there, so there's a couple there. So I'm going to try to answer all of them, Julie. If I miss one, please circle back and so I don't forget. Um, so certainly um, there are some new data out on raised butterflies. Um, so, but I'm going to address the native plant uh, question first. Uh, native plant question is ideally you would choose plants that are from Pennsylvania that are. Um, uh, used by our native pollinators first. Um, however, um, there is some concerns that because of changes in weather patterns that we're starting to see plants that we normally would not have been here, but that are native to North America. And so one of the ones that I mentioned that I grow is um, the liatris that is from the prairie. And because it uh, attracts the monarchs, um, I find that they really like it as well as my hummingbirds like it. So um, I don't feel like I'm cheating because I have a lot of other native plants that are native to this area. So um, it is a debate right now. For example, coneflowers is, is a huge debate in the moment in the local community about whether they should be here or not. Um, I consider those chocolate cakes. If you like coneflowers and you've always grown coneflowers, I'm not going to ask you to rip them out. What I would ask you to rip out are maybe the exotic invasives that are not from this area, like um, things like the barberries, that um, potentially could harbor things that you don't want, like ticks. Um, in terms of monarchs, um, so there used to be this concern that if you raised monarchs, that they would um, not migrate. Um, the most recent data says that they it takes them a little while to orient, but they do migrate. So um, I just had this conversation yesterday with some experts because uh, this year in my way station, I found no chrysalises. That's a little alarming. I had lots and lots of um, caterpillars, no chrysalises. So um, about a month ago, I started bringing chrysalises in to my enclosure, which lives on my porch with the exception of two weeks two nights this year where the, the temperatures have dropped in the 40s and I've brought them inside. Um, but I have tachnid flies, which will parasitize the caterpillars. And so what I was finding is that the chrysalises, once they were forming, were parasitized. Um, so it's a frustrating thing, but I felt like that I wanted to try, if I could, to encourage uh, as many butterflies as I could um, on the property. So um, I was successful in bringing them in, feeding them the, um, and cleaning the cage every day. Um, and I still have one chrysalis left to go um, that hasn't hatched, but we have tagged and released about a dozen butterflies so far. Okay. Can I capture all those questions? <laughs> I, yes, I think you did a great job, but Elizabeth okay. certainly come back if, if there's something we missed, but your, your dedication is very contagious, Heather, that's for sure. Um, okay, now I'm going to go to the chat box. We've got a bunch in here. So um, I think, so what Susan is asking, she, she says, what ironweed for a drier spot? So I'm wondering when you were mentioning ironweed, is there a, yep. yeah. One that likes dry more than wet. Um, so um, I have one in part sun, part shade. I mean, dry is not the only um, consideration here. Uh, that's the New York ironweed. Um, so I, it, it seems to do okay. I don't give it any water whatsoever. And it seems to be perfectly happy uh, with that um, consideration. That is the one that gets a little bit tall and luggy. So you may want to cut it down for your situation or be prepared to stake it. Although, um, as I mentioned, uh, the Botanical Garden of Chicago just put out a report and they have a, a very long list of all of the iron weeds and there might be one that would be more suited for your location. So I would recommend uh, looking for that paper and it is on my Thoughtful Gardener page on Facebook if you're interested in that. Okay, terrific. Um, from Steve, is Vitex a native pollinator plant? Uh, I wasn't sure. I couldn't remember myself. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't recognize it. What is, do you know what the common name of it is? Uh, we'll tell you what I will, um, Steve, I bet I can get your email from, um, from signing up for this and I can look into it because I know we have some on campus here, so I can look into that for you. Great. Thanks. 
And if anybody knows, certainly feel free to put it into the chat. Um, just want to share a quick note from Lori Holzman here. She says, Heather, great presentation, interesting and so relevant. Been a fan of yours um, ever since your talk at the IMGC. So, Oh, awesome. Thank you so much for the feedback. I really appreciate it. And that means a lot coming from another Master Gardener. So I'm yes. honored. Thank you. Uh, let's see, trying to keep up with these here. I was writing them down and then they were coming in too fast. Um, <laughs> so uh, just to reiterate here, you said the two periods mentioned to cut back are Memorial Day and July 4th and about a third of the plant. And then someone said um, half Memorial Day and a, and a third on July 4th. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. So that is the traditional Chelsea chop. And those dates are obviously a bit arbitrary, but it's just sure. to remember in your brain that you should do that. So if you miss it by a week or so, uh, no harm, no foul. Um, the other thing that I have found that works is to do it stadium style. So for example, sedum is not na native to this area, but it's a high value pollinator plant. And I will cut the first third, like the first week of May, the second third, the second week of May, the third third, the last week of May. And that way you have bloom that comes a much longer period of time. So that's another option for you. If um, you want to do it that way, you can stadium style it. Okay, all right. Um, what do you say when people say leaves left kill the grass? Oh, yeah. I would say go ahead and kill the grass. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, strength the lawn. Uh, so again, I, I, you know, I recognize that if your grass doesn't get sunlight, it might die. So I would rake those leaves as much as you possibly can and put them up underneath trees and underneath um, your shrubs. Um, in my area, I have a little area where I have like a hedge. And so I rake them behind that hedge and they sit there over winter. And then in the spring, uh, we start to clean them up. Um, so that might be an option, but I recognize a lot of people live in neighborhoods with very tight um, controls or uh, communities that may not allow that. So you're going to have to do some educating for sure. Yeah, no, I thought it was great when you said that you actually sit on for, for trials and, and testify why what you're teaching is so important. Um, and actually, I'm curious about this, too. Do you know the name of the English no-dig gardener that you showed a picture of? Um, yes, I do. And I'm blanking on it. So I will I will definitely get that to you, Julie. So we okay. can, uh, no worries. No worries. I'm no, sure. I'm sorry. No, I'm that's okay. Ilona asked, Ilona, I bet if we Google it, we'll, we'll figure out who he is there. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's definitely all over YouTube for sure. And I'm just unfortunately blanking on his name, but um, he is fabulous and he's just delightful to listen to. Uh, but I have used his uh, workbooks and so forth um, in planning my garden for the spring. Um, and I just find his advice to be very, very sage and timely and, um, it works. So I know it probably freaks people out not to think about weeding, but um, I didn't weed this year. So okay. I'll continue to do it that way. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm just going through and I'll, I can share the chat with you afterwards too, Heather. Lots sure. of beautiful comments coming in. But um, okay. someone asked if you mentioned the variety of liatris you grow and, and then a response was that it was ligula ligularis, I think is what they were. That's correct. It is ligularis. That's right. Okay. So um, also called my meadow liatris or prairie liatris. Um, but um, it's supposed to be an annual in our zone, but knock on wood, even with the snow that we had last year, they all came back. Now we'll tell you that my groundhog finds it very delicious. So I have to fence it. Okay. So great. He's my nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, going through, as uh, someone was mentioning that chase tree is the common name of Vitex. So thank oh, you. Oh, okay. Gotcha. That's yep. helpful. Um, do to do going down a lot. So yeah, information on um, Vitex coming into the chat box. Um, and someone was asking if his, if the no dig gardener's name was Charles that's Dowding. Him. Charles Dowding. Yes. Charles Dowding. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you very, you. very yeah. much to whoever that is. I appreciate your help in being my brain. <laughs> Oh, wow. So that was that was um, a fun challenge for me just now because of all the fun comments that came in there. So thank you, everybody, for your um, your great questions and comments. And I'm sorry you can't see me. I've 
I've learned it's not important to see me. It's more important to see the screen um, with all the good information on there. So if you didn't, um, if you, for some reason you didn't get that all down, feel free to email me and I can, I can send this to you. But uh, <laughs> um, I really appreciate, Heather, all of the fabulous information that you sent to us Thank today. Um, important information. So everybody, please take this to heart and share it with your, um, with your neighbors, especially your neighbors that are not doing this your friends and um, Heather, this, it's just been a real treat to have you be on our gardens and tonic series. Thank you so truly, much. Truly my pleasure. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And as Heather mentioned, um, she is out there and doing lots of videos and, and on the news and all kinds of good stuff. So I'm sure you'll be seeing her again. So, um, and someone said, please ask Heather to look out for an email from Jackie at nzbutterflies.org. NZ, they, um, so anyway, I will go Great. Ahead and mention. Awesome. That. Thank you so much. Now, I, and I, I do uh, love to speak on this topic. So if I can be of service to your organizations, I love the opportunity to talk more about it. So thank you so much. Terrific. Thanks again. I will go. There's still some things coming in. So I'm going to just let those go for a moment. And then I will get the recordings and the, and the chat to everybody and, and we'll be good to go. So, all right, Great. I'm going to go ahead and end it now. Thanks again, Heather. Have a great night.